heart disease, heart attacks be a childhood problem or an adulthood problem? So if someone's having a heart attack, yeah. that person should be treated by a pediatric or a heart surgeon. They would actually have that argument because wow. heart diseases start as young as 10 years old. Wow. And what you do later in life is all you you're not doing prevention you're doing only you know fixing work later maintenance in. yeah yeah, preve yeah it's not preventive it's not preventive. prevent or regress you want to stop the you know the pro the progression then you want to start as early as 10Hi parents, hi viewers, uh, thank you so much for tuning in, in, in. this is Seema Mehta from the Confident Communicator with of course uh, Deepma Jadeja, my partner. Uh, today we have an interesting guest, um, somebody who has such a unique background, who's such an uh, inspiration herself because she's gone through a transformation journey and her background is so incredibly uh, cool and she's got such a fantastic Insta Instagram uh, name which I'll come to later. <laughs> this is Roshni Sangvi who is uh, a science-based nutritionist. Uh, she is a personal trainer, speaker, athlete, and also a transformation expert. And I'll, I want to know what exactly that is. <laughs> because it also helps that she has a master's in clinical psychology. And she really thinks that science-based nutrition is the way to go. It is her mission to empower everybody to adopt a healthy lifestyle, which we absolutely resonate with. And we are so, so excited to have you, Roshni. Uh, let's first talk about your Instagram name. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Seema. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. And thank you both of you for having me here and giving me an opportunity to share some expertise, which I hope will reach out to and help everyone who's listening. Um, so the Instagram handle. <laughs> so I started um, you know, following a plant-based diet since quite some time now. And um, Game of Thrones was very in also at that time. That's so right. Find the two, and my partner and I decided, you know, the Vegan Khaleesi is a really cool name because yes. Khaleesi represents so much in the Game of Thrones. Absolutely. For people. Except for the last season, but anyway. <laughs> <We're not laughs> yeah. yeah. She represents so much in terms of, you know, a combination of strength and uh, femininity, everything Absolutely. coming in together. Um, but also vegan because I'm vegan and that's you know science-based nutrition is what science bases you're up to date with the current research you're not following you have so many things when you go online there's so many different kinds of diets and different kinds yes. of people everyone has a view on nutrition really everyone from your grandmom to like a doctor everyone will have a view on nutrition mm -hmm. but what is scientific and what is really not scientific you know exactly um, I did a video on YouTube saying but dadi kehti hai ghee khana chahiye Huh. What is the science behind it? And is there any science? And is ghee actually good for health? So there was so much of science. Every in my YouTube videos or my Instagram videos, there's always scientific papers discussed. There's always yes. related science discussed. Yes. Um, I think all of us should align ourselves to that versus listening to people. Yeah, um, because that's more valuable, right? I mean, you've got okay. evidence backing you, and and I think that's exactly why you're so successful at what you do, and we're so excited that you're here. You know. Yeah. Um, We've, we've been through a lot, right? In the last two years, there's been a pandemic and, you know, the kids are literally suffering quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Along with the parents also, because many of them had to sit down at home and work from home. It's been a challenge for everybody. Stress, anxiety, depression, these are yeah. words we use all the time and we are hearing it all the time. Mental health has become the number one topic. And then on top of that, you know, grappling with that battle for food with children is such a huge thing for parents. Yeah. What, yeah. what would you say about that? What is your opinion and your feelings towards that? I think in, I, I, I'm glad that things are starting to open up now. And I read this, uh, you know, meme, which a friend of mine had posted, the happiest people today morning were the parents dropping their kids off to the bus. <laughs> 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 but I think in general, for a child's life, by child, kids is huge. That means from, in, you know, from the time they're born till about 18 is kids. But in general, when you look at these nine to 11 year olds, you know, a child's life, everything is very structured. Right. So they don't have a lot of control over their lives. You wear this uniform, you go to the school and, you know, it's all structured. Now, with the pandemic, it was even more structured. So even more loss of control. Yeah. Now you can't even go out. You can't go play. And this is what's being cooked. And you can't watch this because there's one television and the family sitting together. You can't make noise. The parents are working. So it's even more loss of control. And yeah. that feeling of loss of control, um, you know, for it's it's not easy because as adults, we use these terms, I'm feeling depressed. Yeah. I'm going to go yeah. see a psychologist or, you know, I'm feeling anxious today. And this is what I'm going to do, coping mechanisms. 
but for a child how is he supposed to or how she is supposed to express that feeling okay. um how so do that you was, identify it for that matter identify right? also yeah. yeah because parents don't have genuinely and parents everyone cares uh, right. but we don't have you know expertise or even the time because yeah. you're struggling to you know keep a full time job and yeah. you're at home and you're handling that responsibility and you also have a spouse at home you're not used to spending so much time together but now you're spending time together so yeah one thing i noticed is you know that especially in the neighborhood that i live in we have a very large community here and suddenly the convenience food started becoming the number one thing because already the you know you're working from home everybody like what you the way you described it and then you are ordering all these convenience foods from these vendors who have erupted from everywhere you know whether yeah. there's cheese or fast food or uh, you know frozen food or stuff like that there's so much of it being piled on now i'm thinking how does a parent in this environment think about nutrition and and you know yeah. yeah how how do you do that how do you what advice would you give i think uh, because working with parents since a long time and being in the nutrition field since a long time yeah. parents uh, kids you know literally soak up what the parents behavior is uh, so i have parents who've been on my plan for years now 2 3 years and they have kids who naturally will say mom can i have some broccoli as a snack Right. and it's not hard you can change because it's so much to do with your gut microbiome if your gut microbiome favors a certain kind of food that is reintroduction of those foods so when you're eating broccoli you're giving birth to a lot of broccoli loving gut microbiome yes the more you eat broccoli the more you're giving birth to broccoli loving so you have these broccoli loving bacteria which start growing in your gut and they send a signal to the brain saying hey i'm craving for broccoli you want more absolutely yeah. Yeah. yes yes so yes. so and that's easy because you're seeing your parents do it it's just part of your eating habits and then you're going to so i've had kids and i've you know gone out with the, my clients sometimes when we go out to like meet or we talk about a meal and i'm seeing that little child sitting over there and saying i just want to have steamed vegetables and the parent is you can choose anything from the menu i just feel like steam vegetables and so that what you're saying is just, just to understand what you're saying is you're saying that the gut has some kind of a a, a wiring system or a neuron okay. that is transmitting a yeah. message to your brain yes. telling it that you know what this food that this i'm ingesting right now is a yeah. delicious one yeah. uh, it doesn't have to be french fries but it could be just broccoli it's how we look at it and how we present yeah. it to our children Wow, that's amazing. That's an interesting. Because you just mentioned present, there was this because I was you know preparing for this presentation, I was uh, looking up a lot of research studies. Yeah. And when you give a child, a young child, an option to choose between a chocolate, a bar of chocolate, and a cup of vegetables, yeah, the child is going to pick the bar of chocolate four out of five times. So four out of five kids go for the chocolate. Yeah, right. But you do the same thing, the chocolate bar and the cup of vegetables. But this time you put a little, you know, SpongeBob sticker on the vegetable. Or like yeah. a little bit cartoon figure next to the vegetable. Yeah. Now, eighty-five percent of the kids go on for the vegetables. Wow. Because you made it a better option. Yeah. yeah. You didn't do anything. You didn't change the taste. You didn't do anything. Um, right. But you're just making it more. I want to use the word presentable, but I think the I think it's the mindset. Right? Yeah, because you you put that little cartoon figure over there with yeah. the bowl of vegetables. Also, second, a very interesting study I came across was just the way you chop the vegetables. Yeah, uh, kids likely to eat it or not. So if you're oh. doing these, you know, you have these uh, cookie cutters, and you're doing these heart shapes, zucchini, right. doing a little square shape, and you present that on, you keep it on the table versus you just chop it like we do, and we keep it on the table. Kids are more likely to pick it up. So this is great advice for young parents whose kids yeah. are just sort of in the process of starting to eat and starting starting to embrace uh, a good diet. and yeah. and say excellent advice because really there is a big deep connection between food and our moods right food mm-hmm. and our attitude food and your mindset because if you have a correct mindset developed in a child towards food right from the beginning then yeah. they will be encouraged to have what do you do when the kids grow up and you know you've not done this process what do you say to those parents who said okay fine have the french fries or have the chocolate or whatever how that's do you, you know, even that's where you come up. you know yeah. 
think as the kids grow up you have peers right so you yes. have peers kind of influencing your choices about what's desirable versus what's not and yes. very often that's what they say right even with even with addictive habits like uh, smoking and drinking yes. that's yes. what happens is it's not great or it's not a fun activity the first time you do it it's disgusting but yeah. because of the peer pressure you kind of get pushed into yeah. that uh, that's what so how do you work with that how do you kind of switch mindsets there mindsets yeah it's so much of a multi dimension process and it's so much of as a nutritionist now i realize because my team includes me working with a the client then we have a psychologist on my team who's working with a the client then we have a doctor it could be a dietologist gynecologist depending on the client's issue working with a the client then we have a fitness expert working so it's five to six people in the team working on one wow. person Wow. and i've seen this i'll give you a small example with one of this child um, you know grew up in a family which is extremely orthodox and extremely um, you know protective about the child in all right intentions the child was obese all through her life and obesity starts in pregnancy based on what the mom sees it's called epigenetics that's a huge topic we'll discuss in a minute if you want to but sure. yeah that yeah. about being obese grown up as a obese child and the parents were always like you will not eat outside you will not eat from outside this is cooked at home and you will only eat from the right intentions and trying to feed her the right and the best type of diet but always obese now this child moves into an environment where she's working in a different city so moves out moves and lives alone in a separate city all by herself and i'm checking her food diary i ask my clients to fill up a 3 days food log before they start working with me and i'm checking this and in 3 days she's ordered out seven times and i you know when i'm talking to her during the first consultation i'm like do you order out a lot and she's like no sometimes over the weekends and i'm like then i had to show it was not even the reality connection right. so when, when i showed her connection yeah i showed her you know you've been ordering so much and then the psychologist worked through her through this long process took multiple sessions but then we figured out that that was her sense of control and rebelliousness ah, i'm okay yeah. from my parents i'm earning my own money no one to tell me and i'm going to do this so that was a you know a, a, a version which we had to start changing with me right. and this, so if i create a nutrition plan which is eat home eat home it's not going to work with her yeah it's very interesting you say that you know because we when we teach our classes we talk about something called limiting beliefs so we mm-hmm. say that before your age of 7 or 8 a lot of our childhood is inundated with these belief systems yes. that go and hide into our subconscious mind and uh-huh. then everything we project yes. as an adult also is really based on that subconscious mind and those limiting beliefs uh-huh. and this is exactly a great example of that limiting belief where uh-huh. a person is believing that this is the right way or has been pushed to believe that this is the right way and then they rebel and they then they don't like it yeah so it was, you know like you said when it's a peer pressure or it's you know coming from some i've also seen kids thrive and do really well in spite of the peer pressure it does not affect them but really to do with what's your mindset where are you currently in terms of and i've seen kids as young as 18 year old motivated hey i'm not i don't feel well and i want to join a nutrition program because not to lose weight not to get my skin right not all that i just want to feel well i don't think i have energy levels like i used to have right. um, 18 year old kids so we have That's seen amazing. that also you know self motivation coming in um, but i don't think it can be pushed especially from the parent like yeah a couple of days back a parent texted me one of the lifestyle changes we follow is eat your meal as a family you don't eat it in front of the television oh god oh my god <laughs> yes you have to start with the parents it's not easy it has to start because when you're in a work meeting you want to you know do that and kids are watching that right. so this parent sent me a picture of the daughter eating in front of the tv and she's like look at what she's doing in spite of you say and i tried to explain if it's coming from you you're just becoming more of an enemy yeah yeah let an outsider be a bad guy now when i am in the consultation and i yell at the child i won't yell but if i do you know try to explain <laughs> the child it's okay i can be the bad guy because i'm not going to deal with this child for longer than 3 4 5 months right so yeah. don't try to interfere as a family member it's not going to help yeah. um, you know seek external support there are a lot of great resources available work with a team which can i think do a better job and a nutritionist knows parents don't know what is right for the kids yes absolutely find external help i think that yeah. might be better i think so, one of the things that you said just hit the nail on the head and that's why both seema and i i just lit yeah. up <laughs> <laughs> is because that's what we promote as well and that is yes. uh, more from a child psychology point of view yes. where we say you know what have your meals together and again role modeling because as parents i know i've been guilty of this where every time the phone dings i'm yes. so 
desperate to look at what what does that ding say it's that addiction yeah. to the little uh, beep that comes from the phone yeah. and we keep saying that you know what use the time at dinner time at least once a once I'm a day when you sit together yeah. and you are my and you put away when, your devices when my father you know uh, he says that like you all don't you all you know sit in a family and eat that's what because we've been doing it since childhood yeah and my partner says that does it even happen like do people do this or you all are strange because in his house it's always you eat your meal separately yeah. but for me when i go there i feel very odd like why are we sitting in the room and why your parents are outside shouldn't we all sit together everybody sits together, together because i think we asked that question actually, actually as a survey question we asked it in class and we asked our kids you know how many of you all eat dinner with your parents in the uh, in the night or one meal any meal breakfast lunch dinner whatever it may be and you know the result was 80% of the kids ate alone yeah everyone was just taking their meal as and when they needed to and they weren't eating together and that's when exactly like you both of us had a light bulb that went off inside us and we said oh my god this is true and we started you know sending our parents some little uh, uh, conversation for uh, little tips you know why don't you uh, start a conversation because what happens with conversations also with parents with like you said all good intentions they want to start conversations but the conversation station will be math ke marks aaye kitna aaya q q se 25 out of 30 aaya you know yeah. that kind of a conversation starts and then kids oh, are like, not motivated they, they really do care about the child it's not that they are trying they to do, absolutely yeah, yeah. so no, but, i think i think what has changed is that uh, as a society we used to food was a social thing because you everybody would sit around it people would talk around it you know chai pe charcha we will sit with we would sit yeah. together family would sit together and eat together those who eat together stay together those kind of things we've heard in the past but things are changing so yeah. now that things are changing if you want to instill this idea of you know this is a concept of conscious parenting and and it is really a big part of this process where you consciously take decisions for what is the right nutritional um you know in day for a family so how would you advise parents who want to consciously uh, support uh, yeah. you know uh, uh, this healthy lifestyle how what can, can you start with top five you... foods to include that might be yes. the easiest example yes. <laughs> sure sure this is i'm talking top about five foods i'm taking notes top five foods and <laughs> talking about growing you know younger kids um, and the struggles of younger kids so let's start with that number one younger kids are the most prone to repeated infection so like when i'm looking at an adult you know uh, my clients are asked to uh, fill up a medical uh, questionnaire and one of the questions is how often do you fall sick in one year and an average adult is about two to three times that's no more than that average is that unless immunity is really bad then we need to work on that but for a kid an average kid falls sick about six to eight times in a year Yeah, you go to school. You have these cough colds. It's not major sickness. Yeah. Cough cold Correct. people repeatedly happening. Correct. That's because the immune system is not flared up yet. So let's say you know, like with the COVID, you get COVID once, you flare your immune system, and then you develop antibodies. The next time you don't get it again, or your chance of infection are less because you develop antibodies already for that particular strain. Right. But why do we have to keep infecting ourselves to develop antibodies? If there was a way that for our bodies to develop antibodies without having to infect ourselves, if there's any food which can help you do that, um, then that would be amazing, right? That would be like technically a miracle medicine. Right. And that miracle medicine happens to be in the form of something called beta glucan rich foods. Yeah. Okay. Beta glucan rich foods. Highest concentration of beta glucan is found in something called nutritional yeast. Okay. Now, I've heard about this. Yeah, there are these powders that you get. Powder, right? yeah. yeah, it's yeah. an umami tasting powder, cheesy okay. flavor. Um, and just to give you a, the wonderful benefits of nutritional yeast, one very very uh, nice study which was done, a very ethically done study, was um, kids. You know, were given nutritional yeast and not given nutritional yeast. The kids who were given nutritional yeast, their chance of repeated infection dropped out by sixty percent, wow. which is huge. So these are kids who are going to school repeatedly and they're not falling sick anymore. And I would. Where do you I'm, find this, uh, Roshni? Where do you find this? I can put it down. Uh, Nutritional yeast can be found anywhere. Uh, Amazon has it. Nature's Basket has it. I mean, any store will. Any I'm, I'm very surprised. Why don't doctors? I mean, uh, I doctors don't, don't study they, nutrition. Why don't, yeah, why don't they? But it should be included, right? Because when I'm sick, I will go to a doctor first, right? That's that. And then you, I think, yeah, I think you don't have to study medicine either. So if someone's you know doing. 
a list of I'm taking this, this, this. I have to consult the doctor or my team because I don't know. But if yeah. I have, okay, can you give me the carbohydrates, fats, and macros breakdown of this? The doctor doesn't know because they haven't right. studied. So, so do study the interaction yeah. of food with medicine. So if, yes. if you if you're taking warfarin, if you're taking a blood thinner, don't eat vitamin K rich food. They'll know that. No, so because whenever we go to the doctor and you are sick, one of the questions you ask the doctor is, so what can I eat when I'm feeling like this? What can I eat? And they generally don't, uh, I mean, no. and I don't have anything spicy no. or something. That's all they'll say. But beyond That's that, you know, yeah, yeah, that is a thing like facts. You know, these random statements you would have heard online. Yeah. What, what's the science behind it? Is there any science or not? Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. When I was reading the study on nutritionists, I in my mind was thinking, you know, the, how the studies are designed to push products, right? Yeah. So in my mind, I was thinking you probably have to take like 10 cups of nutritional yeast a day to see that kind of benefit. Turns yeah. out the miracle medicine, the amount of nutrition is needed to see that kind of 60% reduction in infection rates is one fourth of a teaspoon. Oh, and how do you consume it? Do you just directly consume it or you put it in something? It is a cheesy flavor. Anything you want a cheesy flavor to add it. Ah. So on top of your pasta, on top of your salads, on top of your sabzis. Um, just raw. You just sprinkle it raw on there. Just one four teaspoon is enough? Oh my yes. gosh. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we, we will definitely get your uh, recommendations and put them on the, uh, yeah. in, in, the uh, in the post. So yeah. Yes. But this is this is incredible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and parents should definitely try, especially if your kids are prone to repeated respiratory infections. So you ah. know, cough and that kind of thing. Okay. Then just a little bit of nutrition yeast. Nutrition yeast has other benefits in terms of it has it's very high in B vitamins. Uh, and B vitamins are important for your energy boost. So I'm feeling a brain fog. I you know, not feeling like working low energy levels. You need that boost in energy levels. B vitamins help in that. It has folic acid. It has so many things. Okay. Um, but from an infection perspective, especially for young kids, a little bit of nutrition yeast. This is a great tip. Yeah. Yeah, so make your popcorns a little bit more tasty and it tastes good also. It has a very cheese-like flavor. Okay. Um, but just a little bit. Make that a habit, you know, for kids. Right. Um, second important food uh, to include is manganese-rich food. Okay. Enough manganese. Now, you were talking about the gut-brain connection, right? Yes. yes. Uh, your happy hormone, serotonin, 90% is made in the gut. It's not made in the brain. So you can fix a person's gut, you can literally make the person come out of depression. Yeah. Wow. So amazing. And with ADHD, it's found that majority of people who struggle with ADHD, yeah. attention deficit disorders, also struggle with gut issues. Yeah, no, these and I remember this, that in even in Ayurveda, one of the foundation of Ayurveda is that your gut health is the most important. Yeah. What is there in your gut is the most important. Yeah. And now this makes sense that the serotonin is produced right there. And, right. and that is what makes you, I think, emo yeah. energized and, right? It handles you happy or not happy. Your yeah. happy emotions come from there. Is that serotonin is, that is your happy hormone? Correct. So your happy hormone. hormone. Exactly. Okay. So yeah, yeah. tell us more. And most people don't even know that they have a gut problem. So, right. I mean, yeah. the first thing when I tell you gut problem, you think of loose stools or constipation, right? right. So, there's so much in between. There's, you know, go, uh, bloating, there's gastric, um, there's uneasiness, there's irritable bowel movements, there's irregular bowel movements. There's this, I don't feel like going to the bathroom. And then suddenly when you feel like you can't hold for even one second, you have to go right now. Yeah, so yeah. There are those kind of issues. There's repeated bowel moments where every 20, 30 minutes you feel like going. You're waking up in the night to go to the bathroom. So there's so many things. You could not be constipated or have loose tools, but still have gut issues. Um, so you yeah. want to work with your child in understanding this, you know. Yeah. And this is useful for even adults, right? I mean, you yeah. 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 So what kind of foods uh, can they have for this? What is manganese? What has manganese. lots of manganese? Yeah. Manganese uh, is very important. And manganese-rich foods are pumpkin seeds. And like garbanzo beans or chickpeas, uh, but pulses and lentils have a lot of manganese. And manganese in this form is also easily absorbed by the body. Great. Yes. Okay. Plant-based manganese forms are easily absorbed. So you want to try and get, make sure that you're introducing. Uh, I think, you know, chutneys we make at home regularly, yeah? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, see if you could do like chutneys, we don't add unless South Indian chutneys do have some lentils mm -hmm. in it. But generally chutneys don't have lentils. Correct. In it. Yeah. 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 Can you replace your chutneys for hummus and flavored hummus, like you know barbecue hummus and uh, um, spicy hummus? And uh, this is why the Mediterranean diet is so popular because it has a lot of the hummus, right? A lot of the pulses, chickpeas, yeah, pulses are pulses and vegetables and fruits. Um, and also make sure that you know at least it's on the table at all times. 
and yes. it's eating like a tandoori hummus and things like that trust me kids are going to like it so so when uh, people say they have a gluten problem or i mean can you describe whether there is any relationship between the gluten thing yeah. and the diet that they are on is there any connection there let's go to that Th- those are the first two food groups because first it might be it was not in my top five but let me bring it in my top five sure. let me explain you uh, why gluten has got this bad name and should yeah you know? why it has a bad name yeah now for us to understand gluten we were not always gluten sensitive by the way it's a new concept started new concept, i'll tell yeah. you why it's a new concept and also slightly worrisome yeah glyphosate is a chemical fertilizer strongly used started in the us and then now um, you know it's even used in india yeah. glyphosate is this particular type of chemical fertilizer which is genetically modified to only kill the weed and not destroy the plants Okay. Yeah, because if you use other chemical fertilizers, the plants also get destroyed inevitably. Right. So they genetically modified this super compound to only destroy the weeds and not the plants, and which was amazing for the farmers because the yield went up. And uh, yes, of really amazing. But glyphosate in the body leads to multiple issues, including ADHD in kids. Ah. Very strongly related. Wow. So if you're eating food which is very high in glyphosate content, your chances of ADHD go up by a lot. Yeah. Got it. Uh, 70, uh, this was as of 2019 20 so i don't know if anything has changed in the past one and a half year but as of 19 20 77 70 or 70 plus percent of the farmers surveyed used glyphosate regularly in the food crops okay one of the grains which was highly contaminated in glyphosate was wheat slash ah. which is why it's a relatively new uh, concept and a new concept it is relatively new and which is why uh, now if you're having wheat uh, you're seeing a lot of gut issues with wheat right. and i'm right. seeing this very commonly with clients and you when you sh- switch your wheat to an organic wheat or a gmo free wheat or a right. co- fertilizer free wheat and a good quality wheat right you don't have these issues you know right. as much um, right. you could still have gut this virus so you still don't have you're not having you don't have wheat for the past 2 years and then you know you don't have that wheat loving gut microbiome yes so but redeveloping your gut right. because like your body your gut is not used to it yeah, yeah. that's a gut issue not a wheat issue it's not a wheat yeah. issue uh, but glyphosate contaminated wheat is a problem so you want to make sure you so adhd kids especially you would recommend them a gluten free casein free gfcf gluten free yes. because of glyphosate okay. but if you able to get a good quality wheat which is organic which you're sure of Yes, it does not have glyphosate. Then it's okay. It's completely because gluten is very high in protein. Uh, Correct. Right. It's, it's an essential. Yeah, yeah. Very, very essential, and it's yeah. it has a very nice nutrition profile. Like the nutrition profile of wheat is really good. Yeah. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend you know going off wheat. I would recommend changing a source of wheat. Okay. Unless you have this specific wheat uh, allergy called celiac disease. Okay. Yeah. You have to be diagnosed with. But I have never in my career come across even a single person with celiac. Okay. Uh, people come with you know th- people who think they have celiacs but it's not really celiacs it could be some other issue yeah no this is a very rampant problem i mean i've heard a lot of people and i mean how would we know that you know something like adhd which seems to be coming up and cropping up in children yeah. health is so deeply linked to the food that they eat and this is such a fascinating yeah. conversation that we are having roshni yeah tell us the the, the next one, one three of- four and five yeah <laughs> so number three because you we just spoke about life or sweet what yeah. i would do just you know because you don't really know where your produce is coming from yeah it says yeah. organic is it really organic or not we really don't know yeah so my suggestion to uh, my clients is something called plant diversity um, okay. you know make sure that there's up to 100 plants per week in your diet so wow. if you're used to, and this is very common among all the people in india your lunch is mostly rice your dinner is mostly chapati or vice versa but this is the two grains we predominantly use very right. few of us I know there are exceptions, but very few go towards jowar, vajra, ragi, millet, quinoa, buckwheat, trekke, and all the other grains. Correct. Yeah. So the dominant is wheat and rice. So if you can bring in diversity, maybe you're getting that little bit of glyphosate from wheat. But you're switching it to millet once in a while. You're switching to rice once in a while. You're switching to different colors of rice. Right. Um, you know, so you're not your exposure is still limited. So, so how would you advise a parent to plan 
this kind of a, like plants a week play a game with your kids this okay, is what that sounds very interesting 100 plants a week i mean that yeah. sounds like a great challenge yeah plants a week and this is a game which i make all parents play with their kids <laughs> yes. if you join the program especially yeah. then it will be a game because trust me kids are easy they'll follow they, they, they will, listen they will. parents yeah. don't listen <laughs> so <laughs> Do i you have a chart or something on which they can track it so that it becomes fun yeah if i can share oh. my screen i'll show you the chart but i have a chart um, you know, oh, I would love sure. to link that. Yeah, sure, that would be great. And so, like, let's say you have a, um, uh, you know, you have oats one morning. Yeah. On Monday morning, and you have oats again on Tuesday morning, but then you'll get one point for oats. You don't repeat the grade. Yeah. So you want to try and touch on this? I just wanted to say something that is very popular, and I will not mention the person, but there is yeah. this whole concept uh, that a lot of these online nutritionists are talking about, which is eat local, grow local, eat local, right? So try to stick to foods that are from your own country, from your own area, and yeah. don't try to eat things that are not from your area. Is that connected to this gut health thing? There are, um, signal uh, thing that you were talking about? Very, look, it sounds really nice. Trust me, the concept sounds nice. Uh, but also because it's been used by the person you're telling about, um, who's also promoting a lot of other things which are not right about, not scientific at all about nutrition and the nutrition community has reached out to that person. Yeah. Uh, you know, because it's coming from that thing, people are not looking at it the right way. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, kale. The first thing that comes to your mind is not local. Yeah. Okay, but trust me, it's grown in India. It's grown in Bangalore. Like It's grown everywhere. And yeah. kale is a cabbage family plant. It was always right. grown. Correct. Now it is used more, but it's always it's been local. It's always been local. Right. But let's say I'm talking to someone and I ask them, eat kale. No, no, it's not local. It is local. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, potatoes were never grown in India. They came from outside. So, I mean, yeah, so there is the... Don't get caught up. Up. Yeah, don't get caught up with all this. Uh, don't get uh, caught up with that. But second part is when it comes to frozen food, uh, frozen berries specifically, when you're freezing something, you cannot put a bad berry in the pack because the entire pack will go bad. So yeah. only the cream of the cream vegetables, like you're in a berry farm and you're picking out berries and the, the most, the best berries are frozen because it's supposed to be frozen. And because you freeze it, you can't use any fertilizers, herbicides or any preservatives. The preservative will form a smell and right. the people won't eat it. So right. this is literally, you know, plucked, frozen, scent. So yeah. frozen foods are good is what we are Literally. saying. Yeah. Frozen, Highly, especially yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. if you're in the US, you, you want to look out for the sodium yeah. content because they do add sodium sometimes, but then highly suggest berries. Because you know they are saying have, berries are the have the highest antioxidants. Very high. And but, that'll, but what berries do we get in India? It's very seasonal, right? Like strawberries come only yeah. in winter. Yeah. Frozen berries are throughout so the year. Frozen is a good alternative, yeah. Good yeah, option. Yeah. Yes, but amla is much more antioxidant than berries. So if you can't get berries or if it's too expensive for you, don't have uh, access to frozen berries, then one amla per day is an alternative. An alternative, okay. Great. Then the antioxidant content of a cup of blueberries is amla. Right. One right. amla. Yeah. Yes. So it's very, wow. very beneficial. Yeah. Um, and I, I know you want to go into your top five list, but just before that, I mean, I know a lot of the young kids, especially the teenagers today, uh, I, I mean, I was talking to one neighbor of mine who's also an nutritionist and she was saying she's seeing a lot of cases of uh, teenagers having sugar issues like diabetes or yes. they're having cholesterol. I mean, these are two, the top two diseases in India right now, I would Very say. young. Yeah. Cancer, uh, cancer is a thing to sugar. You know, how do you, it's like cancer is linked to sugar. So how, I mean, if I tell my daughter, come on, don't eat a, a chocolate chip cookie or a muffin, go for a banana. You know, it's very hard to have this dialogue and conversation. So what would you say to these kids who are watching and, you know, how so, should you look at these things? Uh, 50 years back, actually the medical institute was a medical, uh, you know, the top who's who were having an argument. Should cholesterol be, uh, should heart disease, heart attacks be, a childhood problem or an adulthood problem. So if someone's having a heart attack, yeah. that person should be treated by a pediatric or a heart surgeon. They were actually having that argument because wow. heart diseases start as young as 10 years old. Wow. And what you do later in life is all you're, you're not doing prevention. You're doing only, you know, fixing work sort later. Maintenance, yeah, yeah. Preve maintenance yeah it's, not preventive. it's not preventive. It's not to prevent or regress you want to stop the you know the uh, the progression then you want to start as early as 10 years 
and wow. this is so surprising so uh, this was another thing the academy of pediatrics uh, as per their latest guidelines you want your 9 to 11 year olds to get tested for cholesterol yes 9 to 11 year olds imagine which makes course, sense actually which makes yeah. sense because you can start early instead of being regressive i mean you can be preventive right that's a great yeah. and Otherwise, i had no idea i mean i think this is a amazing uh, piece it's of paper no yeah that and it's not vegetarian is non vegetarians everyone and you know what is a shocking thing when they look at cholesterol there are these top 10 factors for cholesterol drinking is one of them smoking is one of them kids don't do anything uh, the only factor the kid is exposed true. to is diet correct so eating what's on your plate and that is the only thing causing cholesterol and that is an easy fix trust me to work with a 10 year old in terms of fixing food habits is much easier than an 18 year old correct yes. right? yes. work but yeah. at that age at the age of 10 you might not even need to work if the kid is lear- learning from you so what is cooked at home is cooked at home is is being you know is eating the same yeah. thing yeah and you know, will not have that much freedom to go out and order and eat by themselves right. so you can fix it at that age but 10 year olds can if you open up you know the arteries and veins of 10 year olds you could get these fat tissue scarrings which yeah. lead to become cholesterol in life and that needs to be, be prevented at that age wow um, Okay. Don't eat cholesterol if you don't want cholesterol, and don't eat saturated fats which cause cholesterol. Biggest contributors are meat and dairy. So right. But that's a, that's a tough battle, isn't it, Roshni? With the, with the, you know, yeah. how do you? I know because kids are constantly they're on social media, they're talking to their friends, they go to birthday parties, there are there's pizza and there's you know cheese yeah. and there's all kinds of a lot of junk food. That's something that contributes towards cholesterol. Yeah. how do we as parents i mean obviously we'll have to find a balance we But cannot at least happen 20% of the year it may yes. be once a week twice correct. maybe that's it But no then more. that's where it starts the habit starts and yeah correct yeah. but uh, you know give your child the freedom to do whatever you also don't want a child who's sitting away and saying i'm gluten allergy and this allergy that allergy and sitting in the side you also not like it So yeah. you want your kid to be able to do whatever they want during those parties, but so I me. like that. I like that challenge that you talked about, where you know have this chart of hundred plants in a week, yes. and yeah. the kids involved yeah. in the whole. And I always one hundred percent of the time, the kids always win. They yeah. will always <laughs> win. They'll find new. They'll literally go to the market and find new vegetables and fruits to eat. And they tell the parents cook this for me because they have this challenge, you know, and they are accountable to me. So next week when I'm having a conversation, they yeah. show me that hey, in my dinner I added this, this, but mom didn't add it. Right. <laughs> They actually show that. So make it a make it a fun this thing. This is you know? a great idea. Very very good idea. Yeah. Cool. So I love that. I love your nutritional yeast, which hey, I'm running out and getting it uh, like <laughs> this evening. The second is your manganese uh, rich manganese foods, like your pumpkin seeds. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff. The third is the chart. I mean, hey, that's just a winner I every day. Food. The hundred foods, a uh, hundred plants a week. Uh, what were four Let's and five? Four. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. To four. four is um okay. So we we'll, this is another very interesting thing. I'm not sure if either of you have dealt with kids with autism. I'm sure our reader uh, listeners might have. Yes. You know what is very very ironic, sad, and also um, miracle like when a kid with autism has fever. the autism symptoms go down and it is you know it's really sad to see that because your child is suffering with fever right. but at least the child doesn't have autism you know so wow. when the kid is going through this fever period the autism uh, symptoms go down and this is very very surprising because when you have fever mm-hmm. there's certain heat shock proteins hsp released in the body okay and these hsps are responsible so you know when both the i have cells in my body right so you have one cell and you have different cell and yeah. this communication between these two cell happens through something called synapses okay yeah? and kids with autism they have trouble with this communication between cells yes. yeah yes. but these hsp proteins boost the communication between your synapses so are you saying that they should be given more hsps Yes, the simple thing is they should be given foods which naturally without the fever, because you don't can't keep it. Yeah, we don't. We don't want them to have fever, yeah. but something you can just introduce foods which are which naturally boost the presence of HSPs in the body. Um, that's it. Then you try. You have this kid whose intelligence level is higher. You have this kid whose performance is higher. Um, and these foods are sulfur-containing foods. Okay. The biggest group there is cruciferous vegetables. Yes. Okay. Yes. so cruciferous vegetables would be i'll give you a few examples but parents should look this up uh, broccoli cauliflower cabbage bok choy kale all of these are cruciferous vegetables kohlrabi radish is also cruciferous vegetables okay. um in my family it's a rule that uh, 
my family is blessed they have a nutritionist at home <laughs> <But it's laughs> like, yes, yes i hope they appreciate you <laughs> yes, um our dinners always start with a cruciferous vegetable soup always we have never had a dinner at home wow. which does not have a soup to start with uh, which is like my app- our appetizer and then we have the main meal so that itself acts in an amazing way if you're looking for fat loss you're finishing your soup and it takes you about 20 minutes to finish your soup which is the amount of time it takes your stretch receptors of the stomach to send a signal to your brain that hey i'm full yeah so overeating people the problem is you're eating too fast yes, 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 yes. slow down it's a hot thing plus it's a cruciferous vegetable soup so you're getting a lot of cruciferous vegetable in very this much one cup, one cup yeah and and this thing about chewing your food uh, slowly uh, yeah. is that a myth or is it true i mean That's, that is the same thing so you're just slowing you're just taking about 20 minutes to send that signal to your brain also when you were mentioning Basically, what you're doing is you're giving your brain that much time to send that yeah. signal yeah. and that is important okay yeah. all right now yeah. it makes sense yeah so uh, our satiety signal you know ghrelin is the hormone which is released when we are satisfied satiety hormone it okay. takes about 20 minutes it satiates minutes. you because it satiates yeah. you yeah. yes Yeah, yeah, so the people with obesity, they don't have that satiety hormone. Ah. They they have it. The production. Or it comes up very late. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it's really not their fault. So, and I've had people with obesity telling me, you know, crying during the consultation that when I'm sitting in a group of friends, I try to eat fast, fast, so no one sees how much I'm eating. No one looks into my plate. Yeah, oh. and they struggle with this, and no one wants to discuss. They struggle with this, so we had to rewire the brain, reteach the client. So when you're sitting in a family and eating, you're talking, right? right. It's going to take you time. Was the sitting in front of the TV? It's by yourself, so you keep right. munching. Correct. Yes. Correct. Try yes. eating a that you know that big tub of popcorn you get in movie theaters. Try eating it without the movie. You you're not going to be able to finish. Not able to finish. Yeah. yeah. That's right. It's very hard to. And it's a huge tub with a lot of butter in it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Here's yeah. another thing that I used to do with my children uh, when they were watching TV and stuff. Every time they take the packet. of chips or whatever it is the yeah. junk that they wanted to eat and they take the whole packet to the tv and eat from the packet and i made it a rule that we have to do it in a vat we have to take a bowl and you just put how much you want because when you're watching you're never going to be able to you won't know when the packet gets over there's no satiety the satiety yeah. production no but i love the, the explanation and the science behind it because until now we kind of knew uh, intuitively that there is not the right thing to do but now there is a science that is very clearly explained Uh, yeah. Been yeah. Amazing. Conversation, Roshni. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. So, okay. for enriched food, um, make sure that one part of one meal of your day is always has to be that. Okay. It has to. So, make it a soup in the dinner. Make it a sabzi in the lunch time. Make it a smoothie in the morning. Anything. Wow. One part of one meal. It's not that you know a little bit. One piece of cauliflower. You have to have a substantial amount. So one. You, you mentioned one smoothie. Food. Now, now a lot of people say that you should always eat fruits and vegetables in the raw form and not, not as a, as a juice or as a smoothie. I mean, can you can you enlighten us a little juice. bit on that? You definitely don't want juices because yeah. fructose, which is the fruit What's sugar. What's the difference? What's the difference between? So, um, we have different forms of sugar. Yeah. Yeah. The glucose is the table sugar. Yeah. fructose is the fruit sugar a healthier form but fructose is broken down only in the liver correct it's not broken down in the intestine yeah. glucose is broken down in both so you don't want to overload the liver when you have too much you don't want to overload the liver by having too much fructose correct. but the only way you can have too much fructose if you're having the straight mm-hmm. fructose directly without the fiber intact yeah. if you have the fiber intact you're slowing down the release of fructose what happens if you overload the liver the liver goes into an overdrive and says i'm not working let me convert whatever is there into fats You, you right. Right. Um, plus liver function over time will go down. So juices would be a strict no no, but smoothies would be absolutely yes because smoothies is not only milk smoothies. By smoothies, I don't mean milkshakes. I don't yeah. mean like you know uh, milk and uh, fruits. I right. don't. By smoothies, I genuinely mean leafy greens and nuts and seeds which are high in omega three fatty acids. Maybe some wheat grass and uh, super foods. You know which otherwise you won't have. Taste right. wheat grass it is disgusting, but in a smoothie you don't taste it. Don't and then it. fruit, so it's a seventy five percent grains, twenty five percent fruits to really help you sweeten up the entire thing. So it still tastes like a milkshake. You're not going to taste the. So when you say grains, are you talking like oats? What do you mean by seventy five percent leafy greens? Green leafy green, green. greens. Okay, I heard grains. I'm sorry. So seventy five percent has to be leafy greens, and yeah. then twenty five percent is the fruit. Is that what you're saying? 
Okay, yeah. and then some seeds and nuts in the middle. Right? Right. Some seeds, oh, coconut right. water. Yeah. If you want a amazing refreshment, so it's a great way to start the day by Achy. putting Otherwise, all the seeds. Otherwise, you're gonna have so much kale, especially yeah. kale. Yes. You're gonna have it. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you develop the liking for raw foods, you will not have a salad. Right. And to develop the liking, you need the gut microbiome. To get the gut microbiome, you need to eat it in a smoothie form first. Right. Now, after years of doing smoothies, I love my salads, but it never started off like that. Yeah, because most kids resist salads. They don't really enjoy it as much. Yeah. Although nowadays I see a lot of uh, parents. Sorry, of parents are, are introducing salad with interesting dressings and interesting types of salads. So kids are getting involved in that. But uh, yeah. Deepa, go ahead with your question. Yeah. And no, what I was saying was smoothies are. So what you're saying is the morning green smoothie that you talk about. It's all raw. It's raw kale, raw palak, raw, raw everything. Raw. Yeah, everything is raw. So even yeah. your cruciferous vegetables is okay to have raw. Your cabbage, yes, unless, you have uh, thyroid, uh, unless you have thyroid, but kids don't have to mostly mostly worry about thyroid. Yeah. Um, but it's absolutely okay and highly suggested also. But because cruciferous vegetables, when you're cooking it, you're getting rid of some of the sulforaphane, which is the important compound. Yeah, and so especially Indian, Indian sabzis, no. Especially Indian sabzis, you tend to overcook it, right? Yeah. yeah. The way to regenerate some of the sulforaphane, though, is putting a little bit of mustard seeds or mustard powder on your cruciferous vegetables. That's why our cabbage and cauliflower sabzis mostly have mustard seeds in it. Mm. Yeah. Oh, you can it. Mustard has a compound which helps you regenerate the sulforaphane. But otherwise, if you can do it raw, wonderful. But we have soups daily, and we are doing fine, and it's still getting. But cruciferous vegetables throughout your life, besides your, you know, uh, the it helps you fix those synapses throughout your life. Cruciferous vegetables prevent you from cancers. Very anti-cancer properties. Wow. Highly wow. antioxidant. Um, oxidation is what causes aging. Literally, scientifically speaking, if you want to stop aging, you stop oxidation. Um, if you read, you know, Amish Tripathi's the uh, Sh uh, Sh uh, Shiva trilogy. Yes, yes. Talks about the somras. Somras yes. is this, you know, drink which you consume and it stops aging. But all it's doing is getting. He talks about when the person drinks somras, you're getting a fever and you're getting sweating. That's all the free radicals coming out. Right, uh, right. So literally, if you want to stop aging, you stop oxidation, which is what everyone in the world is trying to do. All the scientists are trying to do. Yeah, yeah. Sulfur really helps you do that. Got it, got it. Also, and make Very sure that part of your meal is that. And make it fun. Um, yeah. Guacamole. Kids most tend to like guacamole. They like, yeah, avocado is a very favorite. Uh, avocado. Uh, avocado. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So if you can do some chopped up broccoli and have that dipped in guacamole, you will not taste the broccoli. Broccoli anyways does not have any flavor. It doesn't have much of a taste. It's I think it's negative. Texture. You know, people have this negativity associated with it. No one wants to eat it, but it does not have a... By the way, you can make your smoothie with cauliflower also, frozen cauliflower, and you don't taste the cauliflower because cauliflower also doesn't have any flavor. It's a flavorless... So, um, but mostly people people steam the broccoli a little bit. So, do you say would you say it's okay to steam? Is it all right to yeah, steam? Yeah, depends on your source where you're getting it from. If yeah. you're getting it from a good organic or natural phonic source, which uh, is no fertilizers, no chemicals used, then it's completely fine to have it raw. Okay. Steaming okay. is also absolutely fine if you're not so uh, you know so sure of where you're getting your wow. broccoli. Yeah. yeah. So, fantastic. Fantastic. yeah. number four. <laughs> um, <laughs> Number five would be omega-3 rich foods. So child's brain is still developing. Yes. And brains need omega-3 rich food. Um, mandatory one tablespoon either of flaxseed powder or chia seed powder per day. Anyone. Okay. okay. A really uh, sad part of omega-3 is in the body, omega-3 absorption decreases when omega-6 absorption increases. So omega-6 is your, uh, your oils. Okay, yeah, a lot of the oils. So if you eat so a lot, the more oil, oil you have, the omega three goes down. Absorption is goes down. Okay. Oh, yes. okay. So, so you could absorption goes down. Okay. Absorption. So you could do your flaxseed religiously every night, but if you're doing a junk meal in the morning, then the flaxseed will have no. Will effect. not get absorbed. I see. I see. Yeah. yeah. So you got to make that connection. That you yeah. know, you're saying, okay, I'm eating everything healthy. Why is it not working? This is the reason why it's not working. There's a science behind it. That yeah. when, you, when you want to increase your when your when your omega six goes up, your omega yeah. three kind of drops, so you, you it doesn't get absorbed in the body. It fights for the same receptors, and omega six sort of overpowers omega three in the body. Yeah. So, yeah. so like Roshni, it. tell us, though, tell our parents, how do we take? Do we just take that one teaspoon of flaxseed, like a? Um, um, you know, um, if you're doing a roti chapati, you can put it in your dough. Put it in the atta. Yeah, yeah. they won't even know. 
Yeah. yeah. So it's flax or chia. So chia seed puddings are amazing. Uh, we made a recently very nice passion fruit chia seed pudding when passion fruits were in season. Yeah. Uh, and it was a, you know, post desert made with jaggery. So it was really healthy. Uh, not jaggery, sorry, dates. It was really healthy. So it's a whole fat. You but know, what, you, now, now wow. one, you know, I, I remember fat. talking to my mom and saying that, you know what, I have started eating a lot of dates because, you know, it's, uh, it's sugar free, right? And it's natural. And it's amazing. And she yeah. said, oh, yeah, but be careful. You just eat it only during winter. Don't eat it in summer. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, a few reasons. Uh, one is the nutrition profile. And secondly, what tends to happen in summer is your body naturally tends to want to drop weight. And winter, your body naturally tends to hold on to weight. Yeah. Because um, yeah. you need that extra layer of insulin. Generate that heat. Yeah. Generate that heat. So yeah. if you want a fat loss program, summer is the best time. Winter is not a good time because you'll put in the same effort. Your results will be much lower in winter versus in uh, summer. I see. Um, and we also associate high calorie food with winter. Reason being, India has gone through years of famine. So you want to, you know, try and get as many calories as possible in little meals. So all these date laddus and all these things yeah. are winter friendly because you're trying to pile on calories. Now you're trying to get on your calories. Yeah. That's the reason. You know, older people will tell you that winter may ye khana and summer may ye khana. Correct, correct. That makes sense. A lot of sense. Tell us about fasting. It's like the buzzword of today. I mean, yeah. should not children, be, should yeah. not children be involved in fasting at all? I mean, I'll let you talk once you're done with your list. Uh, you know, yeah, the list is, yeah, that's it. So omega-3 rich food is the that's fifth the number one. Five. Yeah. You yeah. Want to make sure, you know, these are every part of the child. We have discussed the heart, the cardiac health. We have discussed the respiratory system, beta glutan or nutritionally for that. Um, you know, heart healthy foods. We have discussed uh, sulforaphane to prevent cancers and to make sure that performance is better. Brain health is omega-3. So yeah. if you're able to get only these five food groups, there are for so many, so many things more. You want resistance starch, you want prebiotic fiber. Uh, you want leafy greens. There's so many other things, but these five, I think, are the. But parents, it is going to be easy for you to just keep in mind that these five uh, food uh, groups is something sure that you must yeah. include in your diet for your children and even for yourself. I think this applies to adults as well. I think yes. all of us need to start eating like yes. this. Like you said, right? Role modeling. Children are not going to eat it if we don't eat it. Yeah. Yeah. You will not have to teach a, ch a child to pick up a dumbbell or to be excited about oh, fitness. The and I love, I love what you said about the gut health, right? So if I start with broccoli very early in my, you know, just, just as the child is about to... I'm not making this up. I have right. kids of my uh, clients yeah. who will naturally say that I'm feeling like... I love eating broccoli because yeah. I'm always yeah. eating it. Which is such and this is again a child who's grown up in the same environment. Birthday parties are there. Schools are there. Schools also restrict yeah. meals yeah. right now. Yeah. So yeah. this is the same child, but still, you know, when you ask what do you want to snack on and they'll say vegetables. They'll say vegetables. So this is yeah. what you... Uh, train your gut to do and if your gut has a lot of inflammatory bacteria which is coming from sugar salt and oils right uh, then you will start craving that and I've now, seen this is this is exactly why you are called a transformation expert because the everything that you have mentioned sounds so simple and easy but there is a scientific reason behind it and I think things have become so much more clearer for us so I really appreciate what you're doing Sarah, Roshni I think you are on a mission to really help a lot of people adopt this healthy lifestyle and now you've shown us in a very very quick and a very easy way to sort of adapt that into our lives. Yes. The, the last oh, question I have for you yes. is about fasting because I know everyone is talking about it. I know adults are doing it. It has been practiced in India for years, right? But is it something that kids should also be involved in? What is your say? So let's look at the, again, research on fasting. Um, the predominant body of research uh, which, which shows benefits of fasting is in terms of longevity. So if you want to live a longer life, then you fast or you stay in a slight caloric restriction throughout your life. Mice given a little bit lesser calories or put on an intermittent fasting form of, you know, a diet, you tend to increase lifespan. Yeah. Does fasting, is fasting necessary for weight loss? Not at all. Not at all. You're, you're, but I've had people say I fasted and I lost weight. I mean, I was following an IF diet, an intermittent fasting diet and I lost weight. Yeah. You lost weight because you're missing a meal. You didn't lose weight because of the fasting. So yeah, if you yeah. strategically yeah. plan your meals to not have that many calories per meal, then you would still lose weight. It's, so yeah. your fasting is not dependent on this. So that okay. we need to get that clear first in the okay. mind. So don't, don't then, look at fasting as a way to lose weight. That, that's yeah. 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 I found important. actually when I started doing a little bit, uh, dabbling a little bit in the intermittent fasting, is the it wasn't the intermittent fasting. It was the not eating the late night snack and the late night ice yeah. cream and all yeah. of that. Yeah. That's yeah. what stopped. Yeah. And, oh, sorry. 
okay oh, <laughs> so that's so, that's what stopped and i think that's what caused the weight loss because i wasn't doing the ice cream and the yeah. uh, you know a few badam or a few kaju in the night when you know yeah. you that little bit yeah. of an inch uh, and, that, inch if you, and that you're able to bring into your lifestyle modification so if you plan your last meal strategically have Correct. your circadian cycle right so you sleep and wake up cycle at the right time Correct. then you don't need to fast to do yeah it can benefit many people but indirectly like you said yeah for kids when i look at intermittent fasting i've worked with a lot of teens with uh, eating disorders yeah so this is like anorexia body image issues bulimia yeah. and these yeah. are the teens They're obviously the teens parents are not aware they share it with me and that puts you know our team in a ethical dilemma to share to not share so it gives us in a tough spot but when this tends to happen uh, when kids are diagnosed with eating disorders yeah. that's because of fat diets in the news right yes. right yes. someone said fast for 16 hours you'll lose weight and you start following it and i think when parents see this behavior in kids that is a warning sign to make sure you seek a professional expert uh, right. because you might not even know sometimes what going in the background you, you could be a very normal family but the child is struggling with an eating disorder yes. right yes. not necessarily it's important however you have i'm from a jain family so for us uh, not in my family but at least my grandparents it was just uh, we didn't think about it 7 pm is dinner 7 pm is dinner Right. first meal is you know after 7 am first meal is after 7 am and mostly 8 9 am right. so that is a natural part of life yeah right. so if it is a it becomes a that is if you can make this a lifestyle change in your house mm. kick yes. off by this time mm. and i definitely don't mean for parents if your current dinner time is 10 pm you get very excited after this podcast and you want to bring it to 7 pm don't do it it will not work happen yeah. Yeah. Change, come with a lot of rebel and create a lot of family issues to the 10 to 9 30 9 30 to 9 okay. 9 to 8 30 8 30 to 8 do this in a span of 3 months mm-hmm. but trust me after 3 months it's next 30 years not your kids and your kids kids also will follow it yes it is so take your time to do it it's healthy from the perspective of course if you're eating a late night meal your gut is not the best um, you know and your body is not focusing on rest it's focusing on digestion right. even not happening deep sleep is not happening so it does have its benefits but i don't recommend kids to go on an intermittent fast ever it creates body yeah. issues it does because they're always looking at the time they're not focusing in the class when can i eat my food and i've had kids doing this you're sleeping on the bed literally yeah. the fasting window opens because you you can't think of anything else but food correct so correct. like the fasting window is 10 o'clock you're watching tv series till 10 waking up at 10 am to eat your meal and that's not healthy right yeah so yeah. i don't recommend kids to go on it but if you can make it a lifestyle change in your house right naturally then do it So you are saying eat within a certain time frame between this so time and this yeah, circadian so rhythm that you talked about. Sana, sana. Correct, correct. So that's yeah. that's really that's what great have, advice. Yeah, that's great advice yeah. because I think a lot of people have no idea. There's a lot of ignorance out there. Yes, I think this is a yeah. fantastic. No, so, and there's a lot of fad stuff, right? Because yeah, you just Google everything, and then the first thing that comes up, you think you know Google is the scientist. right I, and knows everything so yeah. one of the best in seo experts so he keeps saying whichever disease has the best seo you know person represents yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's so interesting yeah if it has the good seo it will pop up right on the top yeah. i have a quick question I, i i don't think there's a quick answer to this but i'd like to see yeah. how do we get our children started on reading a uh, uh food labels because yeah. one of the biggest now at least sima and i have kids who are much older so we've already kind of done a few right things and messed up in a few areas <laughs> and so w- i think now we need to put the um uh, information and the power in their hands and yeah. say you know what here's how very quickly you can read a food label and see if this is good for you or not what i've realized in my personal experience if it's coming from the parents nagging the kids it's not it's not going to happen okay. it's come from yeah. an outsider number one second thing if you want to make the kid read the food label first get them interested in nutrition and the best way to get them interested in nutrition is you design the weekly menu and give me now like i told you cruciferous has to be that this these five things have to be daily and you give your kid also put some control in their hand no they've lost this control during the pandemic yes. okay the entire family will eat whatever you want but make sure these five points are covered correct and trust me they will put a rock to you they yes. will put it. and because they are they have put it they are more likely now you've got them a little bit interested in terms of weekly food menu plus they have control now right. second thing hey, can you look up a broccoli soup recipe if they are big enough in their teens yes. yeah. i got fired i really don't know what to do 
and they'll start looking up. Then say to them, I don't think, you know, this seems to have a lot of fat. Can you look up how much fat a person should have per day? So if you're getting them interested yeah. directly, you know, like this. Um, that's a great idea. Yeah. That's just yeah. nutritious because when they are working with me, it's more of a, they look at me at a role as a role model. Yeah. yeah. And they will ask like, how much sodium should I have per day? And I've had kids ask this yeah. uh, because it's more of a, I want to be like you, you know, with the nutrition, it is like that with all yes. nutrition. Yes. yes. So if you can get them an outside help then do that yes. otherwise you'll have to take a very indirect path and make sure that you're giving them small small victory based tasks on a daily basis Correct. Correct. to get them interested in nutrition first and then yeah. fast food level is it's not easy for us also so yeah. <laughs> I expect a kid. Um, but maybe looking at how much sodium should you have how much saturated fat should you have if these things are written in the food label so yeah. Know, yeah. a little bit more interested yeah Correct. Wow. Correct. My I God, I, I, I feel like, you know, I'm going to sit down yeah. and go through this entire podcast uh, myself because I think there's so much learning here and it's really aligns with a lot of the uh, research I have done myself, uh, listening to a lot of other podcasts by other nutritionists and other scientists and everything you talked about how the gut is, is pushing this neuron, this, this thing, the wiring to the it's brain and you, yeah. giving you messages. So when you want to have an impression about or conditioning or mindset towards food, you got to first satisfy that gut very early on. And I think there's a lot that you have taught us today. So Roshni, I cannot thank you enough. And I'm sure there'll be parents who will have a lot of questions. So we are certainly going to put information about you, uh, the vegan Khaleesi. What a beautiful name. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. give information about your, uh, you know, your, uh, whatever your website or your Instagram uh, page. And I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions coming across. So if you don't mind, we'll share those with you. And sure. the 100 meal plan, if you can share a chat with us, we would be thrilled. 100 plant. Uh, yeah. yeah. We'd love to share it with our viewers mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I, I love mm -hmm. your ideology and your mission to empower people to adopt healthy lifestyles. And we hope and pray that that continues. So thank you so much for being on our show today. Uh, it was an excellent conversation. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Roshni. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye.